It's so easy to start something, but finishing it is a whole different beast. This logic can be applied to almost anything, including this video you're watching. However, it can especially be applied to video game development. In this series, we'll be looking at three unfinished Pokemon fan games that had some serious potential. Let's take a look at the oldest of the three Pokemon fan games, Pokemon Sage. Pokemon Sage is actually the only one of the three I've never played prior to making these videos. According to a Wikipedia page I found, Pokemon Sage started development in October 2012, originally called Capex, which stood for Create a Pokédex. It started on 4chan's VP board and was originally a collaborative effort to design a set of original Pokemon. It didn't take long for people to start making a game around them, and that's how Pokemon Sage was born. Pokemon Sage takes place in the Ouroboros region, which is inspired by Latin America. Typically with Pokemon fan games, there'll be a mixture of some old Pokemon we're used to and some new ones that the fan game introduces, but Pokemon Sage wanted to be an entirely new experience. All the Pokemon locations and characters are original to this game. There's a whopping 229 brand new Pokemon designed for Pokemon Sage. The latest public demo was released in October of 2017, which was nearly six years ago. The demo contains 10 hours of gameplay, a Pokédex containing 117 of Sage's 229 Pokémon, 6 towns and cities and a variety of other interesting locations, 3 Ouroboros League gyms, main plot events, as well as a variety of optional side quests. And oh yeah, there's, there's walking with Pokémon. I love that there's all these huge features and then just walking with Pokémon. Now we've gone over the introductions, it's time to boot up the demo ourselves and see if it meets the hype. At the start of the game, we see the standard Pokémon stuff. Meet the professor, name our character, and then we begin the game in our bedroom. This little girl is our sister, and she spoils the surprise of us starting our adventure today. Heading downstairs and you'll find your mom. She tells us our friend Sophia was looking for us and that we should go see Professor Mangrove for a surprise. We take a step outside and it turns out we live in the snowy Decapo town. Crossing the bridge, we come across the professor's lab. Inside, we meet our friend Sophia and Professor Mangrove. Sophia announces that we're getting our very own Pokemon today. Despite showing up after Sophia though, we get to choose first and our options are Foliate, the fledgling Pokemon, Kidling, the tinder Pokemon, and Aguade the hatchling Pokemon. Honestly, all three of them are phenomenal, but Aguade gave me that childlike wonder in my stomach when I saw it, similar to how I feel about Totodile. So that's what I chose. And in old school Pokemon fashion, our rival Sophia chooses the starter super effective against ours. Also in old school Pokemon fashion, upon trying to leave the lab, our rival Sophia challenges us to a battle. Her foliate was faster than Pretzel. Oh yeah, I named my starter Pretzel. But we got a lucky crit which secured the win for us. Sophia leaves and heads toward Quavertown and the professor asks us to meet his assistant in Trammeltown. All we need to do is follow the path on Route 1. He then tells us we can let our Pokemon walk around behind us. No wonder this game is taking so long to make. We leave and start our journey through Route 1. Since this game is entirely made up of Fakemon, every Pokemon I encounter is new to me. On Route 1, Cub Zero and Bluffin stood out to me in particular. Hats are comfy and easy to wear. I couldn't agree more my friend. Do yourself a favor and buy yourself a pants hat at hoodcal.com. <clears throat> After a small amount of grinding, I remember our mom told us not to leave town without talking to her first, so I rush back home. She asks if we liked our surprise. She then encourages us to go on an adventure. She did the same thing at her age after all. After we rest at home, we head back to Route 1. I find a cave, walk through it, battle a lass and a hiker and win by the skin of our teeth. Turns out the hiker was right outside Trammeltown and upon arrival we're immediately greeted by Sequoia, the professor's assistant. She realized the professor needed something today and asks us to meet her back at the lab. Before heading back I decide to explore Trammeltown. This guy says he wishes he had a hat to cover his bald head or at least a capig to sit on top of it. I knew what had to be done. I honestly thought this was a side quest, but no, he won't take my cat pig. Anyway, I caught this new bird Pokemon called Harpy. It wound up being adamant and its ability is Moxie, which is honestly insane this early on. Pencliff has an ability called Permafrost, which raises its defense in hail. Something Game Freak would shamelessly steal for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. We finally head back to Decapo Town. Sophia arrives shortly after us and explains that she just had her Pokemon stolen from her while she was on her way back. 
The professor gives her his last Pokemon, at least until we can catch the person that stole her Pokemon. The fact the professor gave her another Pokemon makes me think this is a gold silver crystal situation where we have a second rival that's a bad guy but throughout the story he gets redeemed in some way. Pretty cool, but it sucks Sophia had her partner taken from her. The professor gives us both a Pokedex on top of some free Pokeballs. Our priority at the moment is finding the thief. They believe he would have went towards Trammeltown. As I make my way to Route 1, our older brother stops us. After a heartwarming speech, he gives us the Poke gear so we can stay in Dutch. We arrive back in Trammeltown and explore some more, finding yet another cave, this time named Downward Cave. As I'm heading through and battling all the trainers, I encounter what I can only assume to be the Pokemon Thief. He was quick to skedaddle off before we could do anything. Downward Cave is home to this new guy called Coblin. Definitely my kind of Pokemon. The end of Downward Cave brings us to Route 2. We're nowhere near prepared for more trainer battles, so we head back up to Trammeltown to rest, and while we're up there, I notice the mines have opened up and are free to explore. Quite a bit of the mines are locked behind Surf and Rock Smash, so I battle all the trainers I can and meet a new Pokemon called Minorak. We'll come back later. Back on Route 2, Last Molly showed me a new Pokemon, Mushberry. I love its colors. After some more battles, we arrive in Quavertown, which appears to be home of our first Ouroboros League gym. The gym leader's name is Foster. I assume this is because he fosters children. The room before the actual gym appears to be a nursery, and there's slides that go down from the roof of the gym itself. I mess around with some ice puzzles in Quavertown and wind up in an ice fishing shack. They gave me a free fishing rod to try it for myself. We landed a Fortify. It has adaptability, which is absolutely ridiculous to give a Pokemon this early. However, the Pokedex said that Fortify are inherently selfish, and only Fortify that truly care for others can evolve. So maybe its evolution will take a while. After talking to the locals and exploring everything I could, all that's left to do is take on the gym. Foster specializes in ice type Pokemon, which is a nice change of pace. His gym puzzle was fairly simple. You just had to walk up some stairs, and sometimes the snowmen wound up being trainers you had to battle. I opted to battle all of them, so I could gain more experience. We challenge Foster, and he reveals that he recognizes us. Apparently, our parents used to take us to this daycare. A pretty cool little detail, honestly. He led with Panglyph that set up hail. A few war pulses is all it took to take it out. He then sends in Cub Zero. I saw for my own one that it has an ability that raises its speed in hail. Thankfully, the hail only lasted one more turn, and spamming Water Pulse is doing the trick. His last Pokemon is called Snome. Keep in mind, this game was made before Sword and Shield. Snome uses a move called Snowy Terrain. It slows all Pokemon down except Ice types for 5 turns. A pretty awesome idea for a move, honestly. Snome takes out Pretzel with 2 hidden powers, and my only other usable Pokemon is Flute a flying type. One ice ball is all it took to take out Flute and then Snowm proceeded to run through the rest of my team. I honestly thought this battle was going to be a cakewalk, but it turns out I was underprepared. Sadly though, there wasn't really anywhere to grind, so we go back in and now knowing his strategy, try again. We use Pretzel to take out his first Pokemon and most of his second Pokemon. We then sack off Muffin and then send in Flute. We fire off a quick attack to finish Cup Zero, allowing us to get a Moxie Boost. This Moxie Boost allows Flute to burn Snome's Citrus Berry and then fire off a quick attack before inevitably being taken out by Ice Ball. We then send in Pretzel to fire off a Water Pulse, but sadly it wasn't enough to finish the job. All we can do now is sack off our other Pokemon until Snome finishes the Ice Ball sequence or it misses. After sacking everyone off except Pretzel, the Ice Ball is finally reset, which allows Pretzel to live a hit and take out the Snome for the win. Upon winning, Pretzel evolves into Iguadium. Iguadium gains the Fighting type. I'm really glad I chose this starter, I absolutely love the design so far. We received the Snowball badge for winning, along with the TM for Snowy Terrain. Now we've got our first gym badge, there's nothing stopping us from running through Route 3. Here I encounter some new Pokemon. Her Truffle, which looks like a low level enemy from Shin Megami Tensei. Alpint, which is a really cute grass elephant. Kawati, which I thought was an evolution to a Pokemon we'd already seen, but it isn't. And finally, Larvabidae, one of the regional bugs I guess. At the end of the route we battle our rival Sophia. Upon defeat, she asks why we're so strong, and concludes it must be because we have a gym badge. This inspires her to go back and start her very own journey through the Ouroboros League. She leaves and we press forward into Rustling Forest. This game really doesn't pull any punches with the amount of routes we have to go through. Not feeling like going through the forest quite yet, I go back to heal my Pokemon, and when going through Route 3 again, we stumble upon Dreamdery Ranch. I run into the grass and encounter a Dreamdery. Okay, so this ranch is named after a Pokemon. Dreamdery has the ability Psych Out, which is Intimidate for special attackers, something fans have asked for for a long time. Dreamdery design-wise is so creepy, but apparently the Pokedex thinks it's adorable. 
we talk to the farmer and he informs us that some vermin have been startling Dreamdury at nighttime. I have no idea how, Dreamdury is terrifying. He asks us for help and I believe this is our first side quest. We say yes and he requests we come back at night so we'll check back in with this later. All that's left to do now is head through the forest. At level 16, Harpy learned a move called Jet Strike which is essentially a flying type quick attack. Really neat to have in conjunction with Moxie. Pepit is a new Pokemon. It's a grass bunny and I can't stop thinking about how it looks like a starter Pokemon. Upon reaching level 18, Harpy decides it's finally time to evolve and we're introduced to Aquilor. It looks like it's wearing Kamina shades. We catch a new bug type Pokemon called Skolarva. I love skulls, so I'm excited to see what this thing evolves into. Speaking of new Pokemon, this last has an Ericoon, which I love the colors of. I encountered a Mushberry that had a slightly different color to what I'm used to, but I gaslit myself into thinking it was normal and ran away. Paranoid I just lost a shiny, I looked it up and it turns out Mushberry changes colour depending on what kind of berry it holds. As our journey through Rustling Forest continues, we battle a trainer that has a Bowie. I have no idea how to describe what I'm looking at, but it's kinda cute. After battling everyone in sight, we decide to cross this bridge and that's when we come across an altercation happening between two thugs and a youngster. Long story short, they're trying to steal his Pokemon and we step in to protect him. Their encounter theme and battle music is very reminiscent of Team Plasma, which I absolutely love. After a couple of arm thrusts, the first grunt goes down and the second grunt reveals that they are part of Team Aurum. He challenges us to a battle also. Battling these grunts introduces us to two new Pokemon, Pomperun and Chimpoka. Chimpoka looks too monocolor for my liking, but maybe there's a good reason behind it and Pomperun is just another dark type dog. After defeating them, they leave the kid alone and he rewards us with a super potion. Now I've seen all I'm able to in Rustling Forest, it's time to move forward onto Route 4. We meet yet another new Pokemon, Tulip. Honestly, so incredibly close to this arena line design wise, I'm starting to suspect Game Freak stole ideas from Pokemon Sage. Running into the grass and the first Pokemon I encounter is Flauger. My jaw dropped as soon as I saw it. I love flowers, I love frogs, this was a match made in heaven and I really wish this was a real Pokemon. I catch myself a Pepit, which turns out to be a grass fire type. I could honestly be a grass type gym leader in this region, I love all of the designs so far. Continuing the topic of grass types, we encounter Gromeo, which again, reminds me of a low level grunt from another franchise. One criticism I'd like to make is I don't love that we've had three super long routes chock full of trainers back to back with no way to heal other than the items in our bag or simply running back to the Pokemon Center. I don't feel this makes the game challenging at all, it's just inconvenient. After whiting out, we add new Pokemon to our team. I then realize that the game's clock is synced with my computers, so I change it to nighttime so we can check back in with that farmer. Upon arriving back at the ranch, it seems Dreamsdery are the one causing the issue, using Dreamier on the farmer, giving him bad dreams. The vermin he was referring to is a Pokemon called Macabra, which is Dreamsdery's natural predator as they're immune to their psychic attacks. What's interesting is, in a monster tamer named Cassette Beasts, there's a monster called Macabra. Same spelling and all. I wonder how both of these guys ended up with the same name. Anyway, the farmer thanks us for our help and gives us a sweater made of Dreamsdery's wool. It's a held item that protects against being frozen. A really good idea for an item, honestly. After battling our way through Route 4, we arrive at Legato Town and see a familiar face, heading into the town's saloon. We follow them inside and discover it's the starter Pokemon thief. We decide to confront them. He tells us his name is Ricardo and then challenges us to a battle. Ricardo has a quibble, which fits his vibe perfectly. After taking it out, he then sends in the starter he stole, which appears to have evolved now. It doesn't really suit him, especially because his final Pokemon is Sombrado another Pokemon that fits his vibe perfectly. After beating Ricardo, he says that since we're here for this weak Pokemon, we can just have it. He puts a Pokeball on the table and then leaves. We pick up the Pokeball just to find out that it's empty. That's when we're approached by Professor Northington. He saw our battle with Ricardo and asks us a favor. He wants us to head north of Route 5 to Starry Cave and pick up a Star Crystal for him since he's old and can't travel like he used to. He gives us Rock Smash so we're able to get there with no issues. Attempting to go south of Legato Town won't work because there's an abundance of a new Pokemon called Coltergeist and to the east there's a fallen tree in the way so our only option is to go north. In the meantime however, I'm gonna backtrack now that we have access to Rock Smash. On our way back through the forest, I encountered Ericoon in the wild. It must be quite rare. I then immediately run into a similar looking Pokemon called Leacoon. These guys have to be related somehow. Upon catching it, I discover it's a ghost normal type, which for the unfamiliar is my favorite type combination. 
I'm definitely adding this guy to the team. The area I knew I'd be doing the most in with Rock Smash was the mines. After rock smashing some rocks, we encounter a new Pokemon called Rockano. It's a rock fire type, which I'm not in love with, but he looks like he could become something tough. We've explored every nook and cranny of the region available to me, so it's time to check out Starry Cave. In the grass on Route 5, we encounter some new Pokemon. Firstly, a monkey called Talmarin. They're the balance Pokemon, and they have a really cool ability called Content. It regains HP after using a non-attacking move genuinely might be the coolest custom ability we've seen so far. I would love to see this in the main games. We found Coltergeist, which is honestly too cool to be a Pokemon. And finally, I found Cybex. It teleported away before I could capture it, so when I found another one, I just threw a Great Ball and it stayed. It has Simple, which is a crazy ability paired with the right moves. Cybex has a really simple design, which leads to it feeling more like a real Pokemon than some of the others in this game. As for the trainers in Route 5 that possess new Pokemon, I discovered a new fish called Cuppy, the scientist has a Pokemon called Flask. It looks like a flask brought to life, which is really cool. Top tier design. And finally, we see an evolution of fawning, Lamarche. It's a lot less basic than I was expecting. I love the teal accents. Getting through Route 5 brings us to the abandoned observatory. In the grass, I immediately encounter a new Pokemon, Kelanite, which appears to be some sort of space turtle. I wonder where we've seen that before. I'm just gonna say it. A lot of Pokemon Sage, a game that hasn't been updated since 2017, is appearing in modern Pokemon. I don't actually believe Pokemon are taking ideas, but it goes to show that the Sage creators had such good ideas that they were predicting the future in a lot of ways. This signpost tells us that the observatory is to the east and the Starry Cave is to the north. We decide to go east for now. Upon hitting level 13, our Skolarva evolves into Mascoon. A downgrade design-wise, but that's how these cocoon Pokemon go. Upon arrival at the observatory, the door is locked, meaning the only way forward is Starry Cave. To my surprise, Starry Cave is quite small, and I quickly find the crystal the professor was looking for. We head back to the saloon to give the professor the crystal. He seemed quite dismissive, said that the TM he gave us should prove quite useful, and that the crystal we gave him will prove useful for his research, only then to immediately leave. I'm a little suspicious of his motives. Now that's done, conveniently the tree that was in the way is now gone, and we can finally head east of Legato Town to Route 7. The lumberjack that cleared out the tree gives us cut, and tells us that we'll need the Dronia City Gym Badge to be able to use it outside of battle. Looking at the map, Dronia City is right ahead through Route 7, so that's our next objective. Route 7 is home to Quibble, Potter, and Pomperant, all Pokemon we've seen before, but not had the opportunity to catch until now. There's also Doppel, a new Pokemon. This looks like this region's Mimic Pokemon, similar to Voltorb, Amoongus, and Galarian Stunfisk. Doppel has alternative forms too. I found a Great Ball one in the wild. It also has a new ability called Feisty, which raises its attack if the opponent is a higher level. A really neat idea for playthroughs. We get through Route 7 with little issues and arrive in Dronia City. There is a lot to explore. We start off with a visit to the Pokemon Center. I want to say, I really appreciate that in each area we go to, the Pokemon Center and Pokemart buildings are different to match its surroundings. In the Pokemon Center, we catch up with Sequoia. She has an abandoned egg, and tells us if we have 40 registered Pokemon in our Pokedex, she'll give us the egg, only to abruptly say she's kidding and doesn't actually care and will give us the egg anyway. We make room in our team, and she gives us the egg. She says that all we have to do is walk around, and it'll hatch into a beautiful bundle of responsibility. She leaves to go sightseeing, and I'm eager to find out what's inside this egg. After exploring all I can of Dronia City, I determine Route 8 to the north is blocked off by children, but Route 9 to the south seems to be available to explore, so before we take on the second gym, let's check that out. Right away on Route 9, we encounter a new Pokemon, Platypow. Clearly a fighting type, which might come in handy because after talking to some of the NPCs in Dronia City, I learned our next gym is a steel type, which makes sense given its location. Usually I'd be quite concerned for a steel type gym, but I have plenty of counters. My starter is a fighting type, I recently caught Platypow, I have a fire type in Pepit, and my Equilor just learned submission. There's a bunch of people arguing over turf at the bottom of Route 9, so all that's left to do is head back and take on the gym. But first, let's hatch that egg we received. We get a new Pokemon called Lintel. It's really cute, and has a cool ability that lowers the evasiveness of foes of the opposite. That's all it says. I'm assuming it means foes of the opposite gender. I'm glad it's something we haven't seen before, but I'm not sure how much help it'll be against the Steel-type gym. We enter the gym, and this place looks a lot more complicated than the first one did. Battling the trainers, we meet new Pokemon. Kralibur, which looks like some sort of sentient trash lobster. 
Oret, which has a move called Shield Bash. Ignishel, which looks like a sad Charmander wearing a shell. I kind of love it. And Eureka, which is a hilarious name. I love this thing. After aimlessly running through and mashing buttons, I make it to the gym leader. Her name is Stella, and she looks awesome. She leads with Anvalid, clearly an evolution of Oret. Big Leron vibes from this one. After a bit of back and forth, her setting up spikes, me spamming flame charge, our Pepe is taken out by a shield bash. I then go to Pretzel to finish off the Anvalid, but it takes me by surprise when it outspeeds and goes for its final layer of spikes. We level up and learn Brine. Then she sends in another evolved Pokemon called Croglock. A hilarious name, but the design is actually really sick. Two rock smashes was enough to take it out, and her third and final Pokemon is Magnetogre, which honestly doesn't look like it should be obtainable by Gym 2. This thing looks insane. I go for a Brine, assuming it must have low special defense, but it absolutely tanked it and lowered my speed with Bulldoze. It then outspeeds me and finishes us off before we can get another hit. I go into Flute, hoping Submission is able to chip it down. It does about 40%, but Shield Bash finishes us off. My only remaining Pokemon don't seem like they'll stand a chance. I go into Dreamer, just in case dropping its special attack saves us. To my surprise, we live a Bulldoze and are able to get a Yawn off. The second Bulldoze takes us out, but Magnetogre is now asleep. I send in Platypow and fire off a low sweep. It doesn't do too much damage, but it does lower its speed. Two more low sweeps later and Magnetogre finally wakes up and takes out Platypow. Having its speed drop three times is enough for Mogwai to finish off Magnetogre with a Nightshade. That was a hard battle, I had to pull out all the stops. For winning, we get the Forge Badge, which means we can use Cut outside of battle, and we get TM 101, Shield Bash. The better your Pokemon's defense, the stronger the attack. Very similar to Body Press. Now that's done, my next objective is to backtrack to all the cut trees and see what I missed out on. Cutting down some trees in Rustling Forest brings us to this trainer that has a Capybara, an evolution of Capig. It surprised me, it's actually really well designed for an early route rodent. This bug maniac has three new Pokemon, Kara Crust, Kara Jewel, and Kara Nox. Looking at their Pokedex placement, they appear to be split evolutions of Larvabidae, so I checked the wiki, and they are indeed. Larvabidae evolves at level 19, and depending on its attack and defense, it evolves into different Pokemon. Exactly the same as Tyrogue. I decided to swing by the ranch again because I saw on the wiki that Macabra could be found there. It reminds me of Weavile a bit. After exploring some more, I discovered that Route 6, Route 8, and Route 9 are still blocked off, so the only new place we can go to is Dronia Museum. Looking around the museum, and we come across the CEO of Minacorp. We chat a little bit, then a loud noise comes from outside. Team Aurum stole some historic artifacts, and because we have two gym badges, it's up to us to follow them to the scrapyard and retrieve them. Once we arrive, there's three grunts in our way. I prepare to battle them, but before I can, from the skies, jumps down Pokemon, a superhero. <laughs> He's got a Pokeball for a head. I wonder where we've seen that before. The team Aurum grunts chase Pokemon, leaving me to continue to explore the scrapyard. There were plenty more grunts where that came from though, and we get to see Quibble's evolution for Waddle. After battling our way through the grunts, we come across the team Aurum admin. She challenges us to a battle and leads Cobalt, which looks like an evolution of Coblin. It appears to be part steel type, so I sack off Dreamer and then send in Platypow to try and get a cheeky knockout with a lower leveled Pokemon. Unfortunately, it's not enough, but I leave it up to Pepit at 1 HP to pick up the kill and gain a bunch of EXP as a reward. Next comes Samayan, clearly the evolution of Chimpoka. I like this a lot more, the colors aren't as monotone. Predicting a fighting move, I send in Mogwai as Samayan goes for revenge. Samayan then uses Foresight as I curse. Thinking about it, curse works really well with Regenerator, so I swap into Pretzel and take a low sweep. Despite the speed drop, Pretzel's still faster, and a combination of Brine and Curse finishes off the Samayan. The admin's final Pokemon is Shellocene, which looks a lot less like a Charmander now. Still unable to outspeed Pretzel, we take it out with two Brines and defeat the Team Aurum admin. She laughs and says that our battle was refreshing. It's been a while since she's lost. She assures us, however, that it won't happen again. She takes off, and the police arrive shortly after. Most of the artifacts were recovered, except a suit of armor, and because of that, the museum will be closed until the police investigate. For our efforts, we were rewarded with the item finder. We can finally check out the rest of Route 9, and I encounter a trainer with this beautiful Pokemon called Solakari. Apparently, it can be caught on Route 10. All I know is, I need one. We battle our way through Route 9, and then we arrive at the tropical Route 10, where we meet some new Pokemon. Pounther. It's cute. Slatic. It's a lizard. I love lizards. Cardonite, an angry looking chick. And the one you've been waiting for, Solakari. 
Despite having drought, it's actually a normal flying type, which is perfectly fine by me. As I head back to the Pokemon Center to recover, I accidentally stumbled upon Route 11, where this little boy informs us that the area up ahead isn't finished yet and it'll be the next area after version 2.0. We're to head east towards Route 10 to continue the demo. I knew this would be coming up sometime, but I've gotten really attached to my Pokemon and I don't want to see this playthrough come to an end. At level 28, our Pepe evolves into Hopanero, which I love the name of and upon seeing its evolution, the starter Pokemon vibes I get from this just went up even more. Pokemon Sage has a few Pokemon that look like they could be starter Pokemon. I think Hopanero is my favorite design so far. I would love this to be a real Pokemon. Also, can I just say, I never noticed before, but the animation you get when evolving seems to vary depending on the type of Pokemon. I think that is such an insane attention to detail, I absolutely love it. At the end of Route 10, we arrive at Andante Bay. Looking at the map, and I see there's Cameron's Gym, which caught me by surprise. I was expecting to have to backtrack through Route 6 to take on Ashley's gym as the third and final gym of the demo, so with newfound knowledge that we're in the final area of the demo, I waste no time and start exploring. We find a lighthouse that hasn't been working for some time. The old guy at the top suggests maybe we can fix the fuse box downstairs, so I give it a go and it looks like one of those fossil puzzles from Gen 2. It wasn't too hard to solve and our reward was a good rod. Exploring Andante Bay some more and we come across Professor Northington's house. I went to head inside but the door was locked. I tossed the coin into this fountain and wished that this game would continue development. Uh, I don't think this is meant to happen. After stocking up on some potions and having explored everywhere the bay has to offer, all that's left to do is challenge the gym. That's when we bump into our rival Sophia and she challenges us to a battle. Hopanero takes out her first two Pokemon with ease, then we meet a new friend called Pyrote. I switch into Pretzel and take it out with a single brine. Sophia also has a Cybex. I guess she just really likes goats. A Shadow Claw finishes it off and upon defeat, Sophia explains that training has been really rough for her lately. She says she'll be tougher next time because of us. Then she leaves, allowing us access to the final gym of the demo. Cameron is a water type specialist, which I don't have many answers for. I did however pick up a water stone, which I discovered evolves Flauger. So I went back to Route 9 to pick up a higher leveled one, and we're gonna evolve it for this gym battle. Upon evolving, we get Bulotoss, which isn't as cute as Flauger, but I still quite like the design. With our team chosen, it's time to dive into Andante Bay Gym. This gym puzzle is all about elevators and choosing the correct ones to progress. I made quick work of the first few trainers, and then I stumbled upon this scientist. He sent in a Flauger that looks different. There wasn't an animation to indicate that it was shiny, so apparently this Pokemon, like a few others, just comes in different forms, which is neat. This diver has a Fettelkish, which is clearly just Kettlefish swapped around. The design is cool too. This other diver has a Barracute, which it is not cute, but I'm curious to see what it evolves into. Then there's Leafish, which honestly, I think they could do better in terms of a name, but the design is solid. Having beat all the trainers, we arrive in front of the gym leader. He has four Pokemon and leads with Nursery. She's cool, definitely a Pokemon I would use on my team. I don't know if you've been able to tell, but I'm just now realizing so far that each gym battle has its own unique theme. I quite like that. I fire off a Leech Seed, Nursery used Death Charge, which we clearly resist. I then go for Bullet Seed as she sets up a light screen. Despite the level difference, I think we can beat her 1v1. She goes for another Death Charge, which paralyzes us this time. I use a Full Heal as Cameron delays the inevitable and uses a Super Potion. Nursery then reveals it has Wish. No wonder I was getting a load of Mola vibes from this thing. I miss Sing four times in a row as Nursery sets up Reflect. The fifth Sing connects and the light screen wears off. Reflect is stopping us from doing any serious damage, but thankfully the Leech Seed does enough chip damage for us to finish it off right as it wakes up and uses one last wish. Barracute comes in next. I set up a Leech Seed again and then Bullet Seed. I get a lucky crit, taking it out instantly. We're introduced to a new Pokemon called Scubug. Assuming it's a bug type, I decide to swap out into Flute, anticipating the oncoming bug move. I made the right call, but it unfortunately O-code Flute. I send in Pretzel, who I just recently taught Rock Tomb to, and fire off one of those, only to miss. The second signal beam finishes off Pretzel, and then I realize with how much damage it's doing, it must have tinted lens. That, or an ungodly special attack stat. I send in Hop and Arrow and connect two magical leaves before going down. I then remember I have Luna with Drought. I'm not sure if it'll help much, but my options were limited. I use this as an opportunity to heal up Poppy, as Luna somehow lives on 1 HP. 
We fire off a quick attack for some chip damage, and then I send in Mogwai. Mogwai has huge special defense and regenerator. The signal beam unfortunately does over half though, and I decided laying a curse on Skullbug was my best chance at beating it. Mogwai goes down, and Poppy is my only Pokemon left. I check my battle items, and I discover I conveniently have an X special defense. I use this, which was enough to let Poppy survive the signal beam, and then curse finishes off the Scubus. Unfortunately for us, there is one last Pokemon, Glockto. It looks like a lava lamp. Our only option is to use a super potion and hope whatever he uses doesn't two hit KO us. He has flame burst and suddenly my drought is working against me. I realized that this is gen 5 mechanics so the weather is permanent. I was able to heal enough health to fire off a leech seed and of course we missed. For some reason the AI used depth charge which allowed us another opportunity to leech seed. It connects and we finally have a chance to win. I must have stalled them out of flame burst because they stopped coming and Glockto used Whirlpool instead. This allowed me to feel comfortable enough to use Bullet Seed, speeding up the inevitable defeat of Cameron. For winning, we got the Death Badge, as well as TM-102, Death Charge. A move that does more damage if the opponent is underwater and has a chance to paralyze. Really solid idea for a move. Cameron says that we've come far and not to stop now. Our next challenge awaits, but he couldn't be further from the truth. Having defeated the third gym, our time in the Urobos region is coming to a close. I head back to the Pokemon Center and to my surprise, Professor Northington is outside of his house. He tells us the crystal we gave him has helped a lot and to come inside his home so we can see. Once inside, he says he's preparing for a journey of his own and to excuse the mess. He explains some old Old tales of Urobos and claims they aren't simply old tales but in fact are real. His research proves it. He wants us to help him. Obviously we can't, but even if we could, this honestly sounds so fishy. I do not trust this guy. After leaving his house, he steps outside with us and asks us to really consider his offer. That's when Sequoia shows up and asks us how our Pokedex is coming along. She notices Professor Northington and asks him, isn't it time that he and Professor Mangrove set their differences aside? It'll have been years since they last saw each other and they used to be friends. Northington clearly doesn't like this, asking if she's in the position to lecture him about his past. He's had enough of her sanctimonious tone. He has nothing more to discuss with a narrow-minded fossil like Mangrove. Hey, at least Mangrove is an actual professor, not some bitter old putz fiddling around with storybooks. Cal, Always keep in mind the source of all your information. The same event can look very different from two different points of view. You must remain vigilant and careful about those with whom you associate. And above all else, never give up on your dreams. Sometimes they are all one has left. Northington leaves and Sequoia believes that she messed up. She'd thought that they'd have buried the hatchet by now. She doesn't feel comfortable getting into details, but Northington and Mangrove used to be close friends until they had a falling out over some research. It was before she was around, so she misjudged how bad it really was. She then goes on to say she's glad she ran into us because she has a gift from our mother. It's a bicycle. After Sequoia leaves, we get a notification that this is the end of the version 2.0 demo. There is no further story content from here, but we can continue to train and evolve our Pokemon if we wish. Before closing out the game, I figured it'd be worth looking around to see if any new routes opened up. Route 8 is still closed off by children, Route 6 is closed off by all these horses, and Cycling Road isn't available yet, so I guess this really is the end. However, while researching this video, I come across the Pokemon Sage Discord server, and to my surprise, as recent as August 2nd, 2023, they posted updates regarding the game's development. It's mostly visuals, like move animations and artwork, but despite the general public, including myself, thinking this project was abandoned, a decade later, they're still chipping away at it. Since this isn't actually an abandoned Pokemon game, I want to give some feedback of the 10 hour demo we just played. There's a good variety of Pokemon to use of each type. I never felt like I had to use a specific Pokemon I didn't really want to just to fit a niche on my team. The graphics are beautiful, especially for its time. From what I've seen so far, it has a very believable yet unique storyline that feels like it belongs in a Pokemon game. The characters are well designed and have plenty of personality and the game has an unnecessary amount of polish. As for the cons, leveling up felt like such a drag. I would love to see a modern leveling system introduced. As much as I enjoyed most of the Pokemon, some of the designs felt too similar to others. It could be worth redesigning some of them to stand out a bit more or simply removing the ones that feel redundant. The game feels quite slow. If that can be helped, a built-in speed up button would be nice. Overall though, I really enjoyed my time with Pokemon Sage, and I hope someday I'll return to play a finished version of the game. Next time on this series, we'll be looking at Pokemon Ethereal Gates, or as it's known now, Pokemon Sea and Sky. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it.